Well, my path to behavioral economics was a little bit roundabout. Actually, I was interested in psychology before I even got interested in economics because in high school and, and earlier, I had been a competitive chess player, and my chess teacher was a psychology professor. So in high school, I was doing psychology research assistance for him, and then I began studying economics, uh, partly on my own and partly through courses, and got really interested in that, and decided that I wanted to study economics in college because it was a great way to combine my very varied interests in history and science and math and um, writing skills and kind of bring that all together into, into one topic. And then I was very lucky in my freshman year of college to have as a professor for macroeconomics David Leipzig, who is now uh, a leading behavioral economist. Uh, and this was the very early days of behavioral economics, but I learned that it was possible to combine psychology and economics in one, um, in one subject area. And, and I started working with him uh, as a freshman in college and I was hooked. I got interested in genoeconomics actually before, right before I started graduate school. And at that time, so this was in 2001, uh, I went to, I was doing a master's degree at the time, and I went to a conference um, with my advisors from undergraduate, uh, David Leibson and Ed Glazer, and we were we heard a presentation on neuroeconomics, which is how decision making is implemented in the brain. And this was the very early days of neuroeconomics, the very beginning. So this was crazy new stuff. And we, you know, we were talking afterwards, we went on a walk and talking about you know, how crazy it was and what would be next after neuroeconomics. And we decided that even more fundamental than the brain would be genes. Uh, and so, you know, and, and that someday you know, this was the Human Genome Project had just been done. Someday this was going to matter a lot for social science. And so I got excited then uh, and, and started trying to work on genoeconomics. At that time, though, there was no data available that had both genetic data and social science outcomes. So it took quite some time uh, before I was able to actually make any progress. But I was interested from the very beginning of grad school. The skills that I think are most important for a graduate student who wants to do work in genoeconomics, first and foremost, I would say econometrics skills, because there's a lot of statistics involved and a lot of um, uh, dealing with large data sets and thinking carefully about the, um, uh, the econometric assumptions uh, and, d and keeping up with this, the methods and statistical genetics. I think it's also very important to be broadly interested and willing to read and learn from researchers in other fields, obviously genetics itself. Uh, and, um, and actually one of the things that's been most exciting for me working in this area has been that I'm just constantly learning new things, things that I never dreamed that I would be learning uh, as a graduate student, totally unrelated to the economics classes that I took. And I think if that sounds exciting to you as a graduate student, then genoeconomics may be a research area to think about. I think there's a number of, of exciting frontiers in genoeconomics. One is identifying specific genetic variants that are associated with behavioral traits and economic outcomes. That work is just, a, it's very early stages. I think we don't know much yet about which genetic variants are associated with what, but we're starting to learn and new methods like genome-wide association studies are going to be more and more powerful as the available data sets get very large. And economists need to be involved in that work to some extent if we want to be studying economic outcomes of interest to economists because we're the ones who are going to direct the research in that direction. We know how to code those kinds of variables. We know what kinds of control variables are important. And that area of identifying individual genetic variants is actually something where economists can bring some tools potentially to bear to improve that work, something that hasn't actually been done yet. But one thing that I think would be very exciting would be to embed the genetic data in structural, a structural model. So for example, let's say you wanted to identify genetic variants associated with smoking. 
And there's various channels through which a, uh, a variant might matter. It might affect the marginal utility that you get from, uh, from smoking. It might affect the depreciation rate of the addiction stock. Um, it could affect the discount rate. And those different channels are going to have different implications for the moments that you'll observe in the data, the correlations that you see between the genotypes and the uh, various kinds of outcomes that you might observe. And so building a structural model where you then allow the genetic, uh, the genotypes to matter through these different channels uh, and then estimating that model could actually teach us a lot about what are the channels through which, the behavioral channels through which genes work, which is something that medical geneticists haven't done yet because these are really tools that economists know how to do. The other thing, the other frontier that I think is extremely exciting uh, in genoeconomics is building polygenic scores, which are instead of looking at individual genetic variants, is taking indexes of many variants together and exploiting the joint information contained in all of these variants. Uh, we can predict, uh, we can project using some biological theory how predictive these, these indexes of SNPs, these polygenic scores, are going to be for, for various traits. And once we can estimate the, the best fitting linear combinations of the variants in sufficiently large samples, we know that for things like educational attainment, it's going to be up to 20% of the variants across people. We have a constructive variable that explains 20% of the variants in educational attainment. For cognitive functions, it'll be probably twice as high. Um, already for height, it's possible to predict 15% um, of the variance across people, and that will probably go up to almost 50% uh, eventually.